Presented by Caltech. So our next speaker is Professor Jennifer Lewis. Um, she joined the faculty of the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and the Wyss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University in 2013. Prior to her appointment at Harvard, she served as the director of the Frederick Seitz Materials Research Laboratory and the Hans Thurnau Professor of Material Science and Engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her research focuses on directed assembly of functional and biological materials. She recently co-founded two companies to commercialize technology from her lab. Her work on microscale 3D printing was highlighted as one of the 10 breakthrough technologies by the MIT Technology Review in 2014. She's a fellow of the American Ceramic Society, the American Physical Society, the Materials Research Society, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And today she's going to be speaking about printing functional materials. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk about our work in this area. So um, as Carrie said, we're going to be speaking about printing functional materials and how it fits into um, the uh, Light Matter Interaction Center. Um, so a step back, first of all, and just maybe paint a broader perspective of 3D printing in general. Um, it's an area that's been around for about three decades. and largely to date is focused on prototyping, so printing objects or forms, if you will. Um, and there are three main material sets that have been developed for 3D printing. Um, thermoplastic resins, uh, UV curable materials, and powders, whether they're po po polymer powders or metal beds. Um, and so typically the feature size resolutions for these uh, printing approaches are in the 100 micron or higher range, except for UV and photopolymerizable methods such as two-photon polymerization, which really does get you down into the micron and submicron range. Um, our thesis uh, in the group that we've been working on for maybe over a decade has been to take 3D printing to the next level, to bring new material sets to 3D printing. Um, to allow the integration of electronics, to allow you to fully print batteries, for example. And on the other side, we're also working on living tissue. Um, in order to create uh, integrated electronics, we've been focusing on sort of hybrid methods where we're printing conducti conductive materials to interconnect and wire up electronics. But unlike most printed electronics platforms where they're trying to print every component, including <laughs> the semiconductor materials and, and the like, we have this idea that we could do hybrid pick and place. So we can take advantage of all the development that's gone on in the electronics industry to date and pick and place those components into the devices of interest and wire them up using our printing process. Now, what are some of the drivers behind 3D printing? Well, one is the fact that it's a very low cost method. You don't need the complicated masks that you might need for photolithography or the molds or dyes and tooling. Secondly, it really does drive the innovation cycle. I mean, you can go from a CAD file, a design, to a part in less than 24 hours. So if you don't even think about 3D printing as a manufacturing platform, which is something that we're driving towards, just as a rapid prototyping tool, the ability to now do electronic devices and to embed function, I think, is quite powerful. And finally, uh, some argue that complexity is free. Yes, you can create components that have an interesting form factors that might not be able to be done by traditional me methods, but I don't actually buy the argument that it's entirely free because, first of all, 3D printing is a slower process, and secondly, um, you know, the material sets that are being developed are more expensive than, say, your traditional manufacturing processes. So while complexity is something that you can inherently build into 3D printing, I don't necessarily buy the argument that it's entirely free. But hopefully as this platform advances over time, it will become less and less of expensive. So our, our approach at, in the lab has really been to develop these new functional materials and a more robust 3D printing platform that allows you to take advantage of these complex um, architectures at the micro scale using true functional material printing. So to do that, we, you know, we don't use 
conventional or commercially available 3D printers. We've designed and uh, built our own printers, including the one that you see here, which allows us, in this case, to individually um, have four individually addressable print heads to be able to co-deposit multiple types of materials. Like, for example, if we're printing a micro battery, one of these ink reservoirs could contain the anode, another could contain the cathode, the separator, and the like. Um, here, what you see just as a demonstration are four different uh, fluorescently labeled PDMS ink that have been built in such a way that every layer we're transitioning between a different dyed material. But one can imagine doing that switch in the middle of, a, in the middle of an actual filament, in the middle of a, of a layer, and so forth. The other thing that might, you might have been struck by in this video was the fact that these inks come out in filamentary form. So we're building in what's called a viscoelastic response, which I'll say more about in a minute, that allows the material to ba basically flow in the nozzle, but then as it comes out out of the nozzle, it rapidly solidifies to maintain its shape. And not only can it maintain its shape, but it can span gaps in the underlying layer. So again, one of the problems or Achilles heels and more 3D printing processes that are commercially available is you need a support material. These materials um, don't typically undergo wetting and spreading. For example, if you're using an inkjet printing approach, these are low viscosity inks that they come out in droplet form, but when they impinge on the substrate, they undergo rapid wetting and spreading. So here we have a way to control through the viscoelastic response and mitigate that wetting and spreading, but also allow us to print things that are self-supporting that can be out of plane, as I'll show you, without the need for sacrificial materials. So here's an example of a true functional ink now being printed out of plane. Um, this is through a 30 micron nozzle. This ink is composed of a silver nanoparticle suspension and aqueous solution. It has a humectant, as I'll describe, to prevent drying out at the tip. But you can see very nicely that we're coming out, spanning an air gap from an underlying surface to a top surface. Now importantly, even though in this motif we can print out of plane, you still need anchors. We can't truly create freely supporting structures. So I'm going to talk about, at the near the end of the talk, some recent advances that allow us to do true freeform 3D fabrication out of plane at the micro scale. Now, the, the ability of us uh, for this generic, essentially, ink design is that not only can we embed function, but these are highly concentrated inks. They undergo very minimal drying. Um, they're self-supporting, as I said. And once we have this flexible motif, we can really plug and play any type of constituent or building block into the ink design. We've made these conductive inks. We've done hydrogels, um, many, many more. So with that in mind, um, I'll go through and just talk about the rheological performance that we're tailoring into these materials to allow us to have this self-supporting filamentary architecture. Um, what you see here is a cutout uh, of the nozzle. And as you imagine, as this material is flowing through the nozzle under an applied pressure, at the nozzle walls is where they have the highest shear stress uh, that they're exposed to. And that is indicated here if we look at the shear rate uh, map, where you have red regions near the circumference of the filament. And that's the cutaway that you see what the ink is actually experiencing in the nozzle. Now in the core, essentially it's a plug flow regime because it's a yield stress fluid. And so the core remains relatively unyielded. As it exits the nozzle, of course, it undergoes a zero shear stress environment because now it's laying down on a substrate or coming out of plane. But essentially the applied stress is, is, no, is no longer being uh, ob observed or um, imparted to the filament. And in that case, it undergoes rapid resolidification. So we can provide um, this, we can provide a control over whether we have a fluid, flowable ink or a solid like uh, ink, depending on the shear stress that we apply. And we um, want to exceed the shear yield stress how, why, in order to get flow. And once it comes out of the nozzle, of course, the shear stress is zero, so it's now below that, and it resolidifies very rapidly. And the corresponding viscosity behavior that you see for these inks are shown here, where they have a strong shear thinning response once the shear yield stress is exceeded. And ultimately, once the shear stress is removed, they rapidly resolidify in the, in the, in the time span of about milliseconds. So in addition to the ink designs and this you know, uh, very versatile multi-material platform that we've developed, we've also been exploring a number of printhead designs. And today, I'm really going to focus on one that Mark Scott and my group of postdoc has really pioneered, which is really coupling laser direct writing, uh, laser enhanced sintering during direct ink writing. And I'll come to that in the latter part of the talk. 
But this is really an enabling uh, approach for us to do true freeform 3D fabrication. But some of the other print heads that we've developed include core shell architectures and multi-nozzle arrays to move towards um, high throughput, true high throughput printing. So rather than printing a filament at a time, now we can print multiple filaments at a time coming out of a single print head. So what we've been able to do with um, this platform is create a variety of, uh, and demonstrate a variety of, of, of form factors as well as devices using 3D printing uh, of, of functional materials. I'm gonna highlight two specific ones, um, one in which we're interconnecting micro <coughs> solar cell arrays here on flexible uh, uh, substrates, and another one where we're actually doing this hybrid 3D printing to integrate flexible electronics on flexible substrates. But as you can see here, this movie playing, we can also print on curvilinear surfaces. This is an example of an electrically small antenna. We've printed batteries. And we also have a method called embedded 3D printing where we can come down into a matrix, print, for example, in this case, strain sensors, and then um, cure the matrix around that to have no issues with delamination. So if we come to you know, what's really being deployed right now in the commercial uh, solar cell arena, you know, much of the work in LMI has really focused on really high, you know, advancing and driving uh, towards different form factors for the photovoltaic cells themselves and mating them with, you know, concentrator uh, optics and so forth. We've really focused on the silver interconnects because as, as mundane as that might sound, by being able to reduce the feature size by even a factor of three can lead to an increase in the net efficiency of 1%. And over the lifetime of the, of the solar modules, that can really lead to a significant increase in their energy um, production. So if we think about what an existing solar cell looks like, it's, it's made on a silicon wafer, it's interconnected with um, 100 micron, essentially what they're called fingers, that are typically screen printed down and then these large bus bars. So in order to create inks that can be printed through much finer nozzles, uh, say as small as one micron, we first created these uh, nanoparticle inks by using a standard procedure in the literature starting with a silver source, uh, a capping agent, polyacrylic acid, a reduction agent, an amine, and suspending that all in um, water. Initially, after the synthesis, you get particles that are on the order of about five na uh, nanometers, and then we go through a growth process to essentially increase their size to roughly on the order of 20 nanometers uh, on average. And then, of course, we want a highly concentrated material. If we were going to print the material up in the top as synthesized, that would be very nice for inkjet printing. But as I've said, we're trying to create these very concentrated um, viscoelastic material, so we take those solutions, we centrifuge them down to create highly concentrated inks, and then we add a humectant that prevents drying out or evaporation at the tip. Now, in addition to tailoring the rheology for the printing process, we also want to simultaneously you know, enhance or, or pay attention to their performance, their electrical resistivity or conductivity, if you mean, if you will. And so, first of all, if we look at the ink viscosity as a function of silver content, as we go from their, their dilute form as synthesized to more and more increasing concentration, we see a concomitant rise in viscosity. And once we get into that sweet spot, which is this shaded gray region, this is where we can get into the true filamentary omnidirectional printing process. If we go too much higher, of course, we get into a regime where we just clog the tip. Um, and in that case, of course, that's not very useful because printing ceases. Now, with our very first generation ink design, what you can see is we had quite a large amount of polymer uh, in the capping agent, uh, particularly coating these particles. And if we look at the electrical resistivity as a function of annealing time and temperature, these inks um, required fairly high temperatures uh, or long duration annealing in order to achieve electrical conductivity that would be adequate for the applications at hand. But one of the big advantages of this material is that we were able to create very fine scale features, as fine as uh, printing micron size uh, traces. And unlike inkjet printing where you do have wetting and spreading and very low aspect ratio features, as this material comes out of the nozzle, it has an aspect ratio close to that of one in a single layer trace. And of course, as we build up layer by layer, we can go to much higher uh, features. Now, of course, if we can go through a micron size nozzle, we can really go through any size nozzle above that. So you can see these 1D arrays of five, through, printed through a 5 micron, 10 micron, 30 micron nozzle, and so forth. And as I said, essentially, we build up layer by layer as we go. 
Now working with Harry Atwater's group, we were um, also demonstrating the ability to create these contacts, uh, these electrodes, right onto um, solar uh, microcells, in this case gallium arsenide. And you can see here with a one micron nozzle, we're putting down these beautiful conductive features um, and interconnecting uh, onto, those, onto those cells. Now, prior to that, we had demonstrated with colleagues at University of Illinois, John Rogers and Ralph Nizzo, the ability not only to pattern the interconnects, but to go out of plane. And the idea there is that one can now wire up LED arrays, for example, in this case, um, each one of those square cells is a, a little LED microcell um, that has two contacts at the diagonal corners. All of the, all of the conductive features here, including the contacts, the wiring to the contacts, the interconnects across uh, in the grid array, as well as the contact pads were omnidirectional printed. And you can see in the insets up at the top, the ability to go out of plane obviates the need for a dielectric material. So we can actually have air gaps between each of these junctions. And the IV performance uh, is very good. We have ohmic uh, contacts uh, to the contact pads that are on the actual LED cells themselves. And then with this, we have the capability of individually address addressing any of the 16 cells in this 4x4 four four array. Now, one of the things that we're really keen on doing is creating higher conductivity inks. As I showed you with that initial Gen 1 ink, the advantage is we can go to very fine feature size, but the disadvantage is that the temperatures required to achieve a reasonably high electrical conductivity were quite high or long time duration annealing. So um, a second approach was to take that same material, ripen the particles even more, they're now larger in size, meaning they can't go through as small a nozzles, but they are able to, by washing away the capping agent, achieve conduct high conductivity as printed at room temperature. And this data is shown here. So you know, it's about 100 times less conductive than bulk silver, but as printed at room temperature, it, it is conductive. And this actually formed the basis of a whole different area of work in our lab called pen on paper electronics. We took this material, we, dip, we, we filled the rollerball pens with it, and we can directly write uh, electronic circuits on paper. Um, but in addition to that, it had utility in wiring up solar cell arrays on plastic substrates. Um, so if we look at the, uh, the next uh, slide here, what you see is a collaboration with Semphreus and SAIC, as well as John Rogers and Ralph Nizzo at, at Illinois, where um, transfer contact printing was used to put down these arrays of indium phosphide microcells. And then we came in with the 3D printing approach and mapped out, first mapped out the surface using a non-contact laser profilometer because now you have, unlike a flat wafer, now you have topography where each of these microcells are. We have arrays in Z along a flat substrate, in this case glass in this embodiment here. And so once we completely uh, did a height map, we can import that into the G-code, which runs the, the print head, and then we can wire up everything, including both the interconnects between the cells, as well as the bus bars. Um, and those were printed using a larger nozzle shown here. And this is just a movie demonstrating that. So this is uh, ink deposition through a 30 micron nozzle in this case. And you can see the precision that's required. We can seamlessly start and stop the ink flow. So you'll see that in just a minute as we come back up. Start again, and the inset shows an SEM of these of interconnects, right? So being able to act, absolutely control with pre high precision where we're placing this so that we don't short the circuits was important, and going over these non-uniform uh, topographies. So with that, then we can take these um, on flexible polyimid, we can roll these up, they're highly flexible, they can withstand repeated bending cycles up to thousands of cycles without really degrading the uh, electrical performance of the interconnects. And you can see if we look at the characteristic IV curves, both for gold evaporated interconnects, um, which is actually commercially used by um, Semphreus, and through this printing approach, we have essentially I, uh, identical performance after annealing at about 175 degrees C for 30 minutes. So we can also, because of their self-supporting capabilities, create three-dimensional lattices. I've already shown with these very fine scale inks we can print out a plane. But as I said, one of the real limitations is the fact that we need high, t high temperatures to achieve reasonably high conductivities. And it would be really nice to be able to do things that don't require a bridge that could come truly free form out of plane. And this is where uh, Mark really took the charge of being a part of the Light Material Interaction Center using lasers to, to really couple and augment our direct writing approach. So um, what I'll describe next is um, this apparatus 
where we've set up a print head now where we have now off axis um, this ink uh, being deposited through, through our, our nozzle and then coming down through and meeting this as the filament uh, is extruded, we have a laser, um, which is a 808 nanometer IR laser, which has a focal spot of about 100 microns. And the position of that laser relative to the glass nozzle is important, and I'll get back to that in a minute. But the other two images basically show sort of a, a larger view of, of the setup. We're printing on a rotating stage, and I'll describe that in a minute as well. And then this is a higher mag view just showing the, the, the optics and the, the nozzle coming in at an off angle. So if we think about what's happening as we're illuminating the, the trace that's being printed with this laser spot, we're getting annealing on the fly, okay? And this is just an example of a trace printed um, on, on a substrate. And this is the feature that's been uh, printed prior to being illuminated with the laser. So you can see that the as printed microstructure and the annealed structure is quite different. So if we think about optimizing this process, really one of the key things is where, how close can we get that laser to the nozzle? We'd ideally like to have it be you know, coincident almost. But of course, if we do that, then we're going to center the ink inside the nozzle and plug, plug the print head, right? So we have to position the laser some distance away to prevent that from happening. But the farther away we put it, um, we can do that if we're just creating linear traces, no problem. But if we want to do anything where we have cur curvilinear features, then if we go too far away, we'll be out, when we make a turn, the printed filaments will be out of the, the, the illumination spot, right? So being able to precisely locate that laser in such a way that we're close enough to the nozzle to be able to create high uh, radius of curvature features, but not too close to that we plug the nozzle, was, a, was something that we had to do some thermal modeling for. So, so Mark actually did a 1D <laughs> heat transfer model to look at the effects of some of the key printing parameters, including things like the printing speed, um, the pulse duration and frequency, um, and, and the laser power, and all of that influences uh, roughly where we can be in terms of optimizing this. And what we found was that a minimum separation distance of about 400 microns would allow us to have um, good printability uh, without clogging, and yet also be able to give us reasonably good um, curvature. So if, if we think about the, the model, the printed features that are annealed are about 50 times more uh, thermally uh, conductive than those that haven't been printed. So there's naturally a heat flux away from that laser spot uh, that we take advantage of. So this is just direct writing uh, traces on a substrate, and this is a side and top view as, you're, as we're tracking this nozzle. And this is what um, the electrical resistivity data looks like as a function of laser intensity. And you know, concomitantly, as we increase laser intensity, of course, the resistivity is decreasing, and we're getting ever closer to bulk silver. And we can also see changes in the morphology of the, of the printed features. We typically use a pulse um, uh, approach, so a, a 100 um, hertz and one millisecond pulse for, for, for the laser direct writing. Now we can also on the fly change the resistivity simply by changing um, the laser power. And so we have the ability to tune locally the resistivity of the features. And this is just a single trace where we've gone through this excursion up, up at the top that shows we can build higher and higher resistivity features by um, reducing the laser power at a, given, at a given spot. Now we can also integrate this onto plastic. So if we look at this and Mark is actually going to show some slides later uh, today where um, we're down to sub-micron features now on plastic. Um, so we have um, overall widths uh, on the order of a few hundred nanometers. But you can see very nicely, and this is on PET. So by, by localizing the thermal source, we can actually print on plastics that have very low TG. I think the TG of PET is about 60 degrees C. So while there's a high temperature locally right in that laser spot size, we were able to, to write these very fine features onto low cost, uh, low temperature substrates. So as I, as I said, we're also interested in coming out of plane with these features. And now we can create truly freestanding uh, coils in this case. What you see are these movies playing. Um, and we're coming out of plane to create that uh, sort of helical-like architecture. And um, this is an example of just arrays of this. Um, because these are undergoing annealing and densification, um, these also exhibit 
some very interesting mechanical properties that you would expect for metal wires that have been printed. And so this is just an example to illustrate this. They can, under, they can go undergo compression and, 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 and tension over large strains without failure. And we've also been able to create some now freestanding um, electrically small antennas, and we're in the process of characterizing those. But you can see by being able to come directly out of plane as we're printing, we can create these beautiful hemispherical architectures. And hopefully this movie will play as well. Yeah. So these are just arrays being printed out of plane. So this shows sort of a, a zoomed in view of one of these antenna architectures being printed. And then this is just an array shown there. And then this is just the final SEM versions of those arrays. And then Mark decided to try <laughs> to really demonstrate you know, the true ability to create any arbitrary three-dimensional shape. Um, you can see Gen 1 here had no antenna. <laughs> the next gens did. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, no, it's, 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 I mean, I think hopefully I've convinced you that uh, we have the ability to create truly microscale metal architectures on the fly in a variety of form factors using this laser-enhanced uh, direct ink writing approach. So lastly, I want to just describe some, some new things that we're doing in the area of printing flexible electronics. Um, here we've developed a new ink design. Uh, it's still conductive ink, but it's now based in an elastomeric matrix. And the idea is to be able to, um, and let me just play this movie as well. This is actually the ink after it's dried, so this is highly conductive. It's about 8% to 10% bulk silver. Um, and we can, we can print these to create conformal electronics. And as I said, with this hybrid 3D printing approach, we can also pick and place using the same print head tool um, the electronic devices of interest. So this is an example, let me just click, yeah, of, of a very fine scale a pattern that we've printed. All of this is in the, using the silver elastomeric ink. Um, and the uh, inset region there, that little cavity, we're going to pick and place a die, an uh, A to D, an RFID chip, that's going to go into that little region. Uh, these are highly flexible um, materials. I don't know if I can play this movie. Maybe. Nope. Nope. Anyways, OK. Well, if I could, what you would see is a scrunching up that little film and then re, re, re um, flattening it out. So it's, it's got a lot of robustness mechanically as well. Well, and now it works. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully, yep, here we go. Have to, have to show the opening or you might not completely believe me. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, so anyways, it's, it's a very robust mechanically uh, thing. So here, now what you see here is the concept of this hybrid 3D printing. So this is not actually the RFID chip, but it's a dummy die that um, has been patterned with similar interconnect design. And basically what you see here is us running our print head in reverse. So rather than flowing ink through it, we're pulling a light vacuum. We're going over, we're picking and placing and being able to put that drown directly onto the print and interconnects. Um, and we've done that not only with die sets, but also with LEDs and resistors. This is just first a simple movie uh, where we were just demonstrating the concept. But we've built one of these devices now where we fully pick and place all of the LEDs and, and the resistive elements shown here. And I'll show you that movie on the next slide. If I can get to the next slide. Yeah, here we go. So first of all, we 3D printed a little cassette. That cassette holds all of the uh, individual components. So now what you see is pick and place of each of the LEDs. Now, of course, that could also be a photovoltaic cell. Um, and as we're wiring, so we've already pre-printed um, the contact, the interconnects. And you know, basically, now what you see is as this movie's playing, we're just populating that, um, that device. Um, and then ultimately, as, as you can see here, we can power that. It's flexible. Um, and I think this is a, a really interesting platform, uh, potentially for prototyping alone, but potentially for, for more than that as well. So with that, I hope I've uh, convinced you that um, 3D printing really can do more than just form and uh, it can go to form and function. We can use um, a broad variety of functional materials to integrate uh, with uh, pick and placed electronic devices, opening up really new avenues for the design and manufacturing of flexible electronics and potentially solar cell arrays. So with that, 
I'll end, um, and um, I've given a lot of uh, credit already to Mark Scott, who really led the, the laser direct right uh, work, but uh, a number of other uh, people contributed to the work that I showed today, including Bakan, who really was responsible for our initial work in um, uh, silver nanoparticle inks, and Alex Valentine and others who, who did the flexible electronics work. So with that, I'll thank you and take any questions you have. Thanks, very impressive work. Thanks. Um, I, it looked like you were using the laser primarily um, in a thermal mode to uh, cure the, the inks. Are you also looking at some inks that use the energy of the photon more directly to uh, affect the chemistry? Yeah, I guess at this point we have been using it primarily in thermal mode. I mean, we have, uh, because there is polymer in the ink, I mean, there's part of that is going in, part of that heat is going into decomposing the organics as we're, as we're also simultaneously forming particle-particle contacts. But you raise a good point. We haven't really thought about that, but it's an, a very interesting suggestion. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm wondering how you choose the translation speed of the of the head, and what are the physical mechanisms that limit the maximum speed? Ah, that's a good question. So I think partly um, the so the stage itself can go up to a meter a second. So we are not limited physically by the stage itself or the resolution of the stage, but um, but uh, the the ink flow in this case like allowing to have good uniform flow without, without clogging. To go to higher print speeds, you need even higher pressures, and we do have a limitation there with the, amount, the maximum pressure that we can apply in the current embodiment of the stage. So there's nothing in principle that would limit us to such low speeds, I should say. Yeah. Uh, so uh, w what is the curing temperature and what is the uh, conductivity relative to bulk metal? Yeah, that's a great question. So our conductivity is, depending on the ink design that I described, range anywhere from 10% of bulk silver, and that's this la latest elastomer ink, and the second generation room temperature printable ink at very modest um, uh, thermal conditions. And then what I showed with higher thermal annealing or the laser enhanced annealing, we can get close to about 3x resistivity, so maybe a third of the bulk silver conductivity a as a maximum. And there's something I don't understand about uh, how the laser is applied. Okay. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, you, when it comes out of the nozzle, yeah. well, you can't heat it when it's still in the nozzle because you might right. clog up the nozzle. Correct. So it's got to come out a little bit. So do you, do you put the laser like really close to the nozzle? How does yeah. that work? Yeah, sorry, I, I tried to explain that, but let me just go back um, to show you the, the setup here real quick. Uh, yeah. So we went through a considerable uh, modeling, and you can see that the, the nozzle tip ends about 400 microns away from where the illumination is. So there is a, there is a spacer, but spacing between the, the nozzle tip and the illumination uh, region. And um, that is to prevent exactly what you said, you know, sintering up into the tip and clogging the tip. That's right. And uh, at the 400 uh, microns, mm -hmm. the surface tension forces uh, will hold everything together. That's right. That's right. That's what's really interesting. Even though the material is coming out in a, you know, in a liquefied form, it's still viscoelastic. 400 microns below that, we've, we've created basically a solid metal wire, but it's enough to allow us to preform fabricate out of plane completely. That's right. Yep. It's a very good point. Are there any other questions? Okay. Thank you.